So, um, so for today, I want to talk about the general questions that motivate my research, and I'm going to focus on presenting some projects that are related with this question here, that is, what is the role of phenotype for explaining the species abundance in plant communities? And I would like to uh, start by talking uh, out one of the few general laws in ecology, and that is the parent that describes the species abundance distribution. So no matter if we are studying communities of plants or communities of birds or invertebrates or bacteria, what we often found in these communities is that they, are, uh, they consist of many rare species here and only few common species. And then if we go to the tropical systems where I have spent most of my time doing my research, what we found is that these parents that describe the species abundant distribution are even more, more pronounced. So to give you an example, I'm showing here the abundance for one species, the species that have purple flower here, uh, purple flowers. And uh, the individuals of these species tend to all flower at the same time. So we know that in this area uh, of forest, only one individual is representing that species. And this type of extremely low abundance is actually pretty common among all the species in the tropical forest that is often characterized by having a lot of the species, most of the species with extremely low abundance and only few with, uh, that are more dominant. So what drives these patterns of species abundance distribution? So this variation in abundance is the result of differences in demographic rates, so some species have higher chances to survive than others, and that will result in the variations in species abundance. Now, these differences in the demographic pattern has been explained in ecology as variations in how the species are using in different ways the resources that are heterogeneously distributed in the space. So, for example, some species have preference or for um, resources that are broadly distributed in the space and those will be able to have higher survival than others. However, the um, previous studies that have tried to test this uh, type of relationship have not always found consistent patterns. So what I think we are missing here is an important component, and that is the role of the phenotype of the species. So species have different traits, and these traits help the individuals to interact with the environment, and this interaction will affect the demography of the individuals that will lastly result in variation in the species abundance. So uh, as an example of a common trait that we measure uh, as plant ecologists is the specific leaf area. That is the area divided by the dry mass of the leaf. And this variation in the specific leaf area across different species is telling us something out how the species are using in different ways the light, for example. So, uh, by this diagram here, I want to, I think that that frames what is my general question uh, for the projects that I'm going to present today, and that is what is the role of these phenotypes of the different species at determining the variation in the species abundance. So um, that big question has been splitted in several projects, and today I'm going to talk first about the importance of interspecific variation in those traits and the importance of conspecific negative density dependence. And then I'm going to present some uh, results related with a project that evaluates the importance of interspecific trait variation as related with the patterns of abundant distribution of the species. After that, I'm going to summarize my main results and I'm going to briefly talk, talk out uh, one um, current project that I'm working on right now and I'm going to finish my talk by going through some future directions. So um, for this uh, first project, when I was interested in evaluating the differences across species in determining this pattern of abundance, I wanted to focus on the seed to seedling transition. And the reason of that is that during this transition, a lot of mortality happens. So, and that is why this uh, transition has been described as a demographic bottleneck. So, about 75% of the individuals die during this transition. So in terms of understanding what drives these patterns of variation in the species abundance, it seems critical to consider 
uh, what is happening during this deep to ceiling transition that uh, drives a lot of mortality. Now, in addition to this high mortality, this study here shows that uh, the mortality happening here is the result of non-random processes. So in this study, what they analyze is uh, long-term data from a natural community in Australia, and they have been evaluating the patterns of uh, mortality across different size class. And the result that I want to uh, show you today is here. So what they found is that the percentage of species dying non-randomly across different species, and this is um, the different the across different size classes, and the different size classes here are represented by the different colors, and then this uh, is plotted against the community mortality. What they found is that the ceilings that are represented here by the black colors are the ones that have the highest, the highest percentage of species dying non-random. So what are the mechanisms that are leading this high non-random mortality at these early ontogenetic stages? So um, one of the most important uh, processes operating at the sealing communities in the tropical forest is the negative density dependence that basically describes a situation where the performance of one individual is negatively affected by the density of the conspecifics. So in our situation of the seed to seedling transition, we could have a species that occurs in high density at the seed stage, and here I'm showing the different individuals by different circles of the blue color. So if negative density dependent is operating across this seed to seedling transition, what we would expect is that at the seedling stage, we would expect lower mortality that is given by this uh, low performance in the um, uh, happening in the individual. So we could evaluate the strength of these negative density dependent processes by comparing the changes in density from the seed to ceiling transition. And in this case, the slope of this relationship uh, will indicate the strength of, of those processes where shallower slopes will indicate a stronger negative density dependence processes. Now, this type of, of approach um, was the one that was used in this study here where um, they evaluate different uh, seed, uh, seed um, traps and seedling plots that were located in a tropical rainforest in Panama in the island of Barro Colorado. So they could compare the changes in seed density for hundreds of different species that were occurring naturally in that community. And what they found is uh, showed here. So here I'm presenting the result for one of the species that they have there where what they uh, have here is the seed density and the ceiling density of one species. And this uh, shallow slope is indicating that there are negative density dependence processes operating over this community. Now my question here was whether we could translate this type of reasoning but, but now at the level of functions. So do similar functions have negative density dependent effects on the survival of ceiling across the seed to ceiling transition. So whether there is a negative effect of the species that are very similar in their traits. And to respond to this question, I present two different hypotheses. One is the functional divergence hypothesis. So for this, we would have a, a seed community that consists of different, different species that have all different traits. So here, the different uh, traits are represented by different colors and we have a group of species that have a more common function that is the blue function. So what we would expect if these uh, negative density dependent processes are operating during this seed to ceiling transition is that that blue function will have a lower performance. Those individuals with that blue common function will have a lower performance and then the, the other um, functions will be represented at the ceiling stage. However, we could have also the uh, opposite result where that blue function is favored across the seed to ceiling transition. And in this case, in the yields that are able to recruit would have that uh, common function. So I want to test these uh, different uh, scenarios in natural communities in, in Puerto Rico. So uh, for this study, there is uh, in Puerto Rico, in the island, there is this permanent plot that has been monitoring the long-term dynamics of the forest. And this plot is part of a network 
of more than 60 plots that is monitoring the natural dynamics of forests across the entire Earth, and some of my projects will use uh, the information of these different forest plots. But for this study, I'm only focused on the plot at Puerto Rico. So in this uh, plot here, the plot is uh, 16 hectares um, in area. This is the plot here. In 2007, 120 stations were established within the, the permanent plot in order to monitor the dynamics of earlier ontogenetic stages. So for each of these uh, different stations, we have a one seed trap that was collecting all the seed rain for that particular site, and three seedling plots that were representing the seedling community for that uh, particular site. And again, we had this replicated uh, 120 times across the entire plot. Now, each of these stations were monitored for growth and survival and recruitment from 2007 to present, but for this study, I used the information from 2007 to 2012. So in addition to this uh, information, we also collected several functional traits for all the different species in this community. So these traits represent the main ecological strategies for plants, and we, consider where we were considering seed mass, wood density, and cereal leaf traits. With all that information of the different uh, species, uh, we estimate the functional diversity of the community. And one of the metrics that we used was the functional richness metrics that uh, basically uh, estimate the total range of functions for one community. So for example, if we have a community where we measure two traits, the food density and the leaf area for all the different species, we can um, plot the position of those different species in this bidimensional space where each of the traits, the, the axis here, represents each of the traits that we measure in the community. So once we enclose all these different species by one single uh, minimum polygon and we estimate the area, that area will represent the functional richness of the community. So we can do this and when we have more than two traits, we can add more dimensions and instead of calculating an area, we will calculate a function of, fun of functional richness for that community. So that metric uh, was used to compare the functional richness at the total pool, and oops, and that was the combination of uh, this, the seed and the seedling species against the functional the functional richness at the seedling stage. Then we co we we compared that by uh, estimating a regression line, and this approach was basically an extension of the study that I just showed before, that was using only density information. So given that these uh, functional metrics are often highly correlated with uh, the species richness, we use a null model approach in order to control by this effect. So we estimated a, a null distribution on the of a slope that was compared with this observed value. And the way how it was compared was by using this standardized effect size, and this is the formula here. So we could have two different results with this. One is uh, we could have a positive value, and in this case, this would indicate that the functional richness at the ceiling stage tends to be higher than the expected by chance given the observed species richness. And in this case, what we would indicate is that um, we are supporting our hypothesis of the functional diversity, where from the seed to the ceiling transition, there is an increasing in the total range of uh, the functions, right? However, we could have also another result that is a negative result, and in this case, what th this would indicate is that we have uh, a functional richness at the ceiling community that is lower than expected by chance. And in this case, th this result will indicate or will give support to our second hypothesis of the functional convergence, where from the seed to the ceiling transition, we are decreasing the total range of functions of the communities. Now, in addition to this uh, functional approach, we at the same time, we also wanted to evaluate what was the importance of con-specific uh, negative density dependence. So basically, 
we performed the same type of analysis that were performed by this study here, uh, that they were comparing the, the changes in density from the stick to ceiling, but now applied to the 120 stations at the Puerto Rican ports. So um, as a result, we found that when we combine all the traits together, we have um, that for all the different years here, and this is the value of the slope that is already standardized by using this null model approach, we had overall like a negative result. And what this is supporting is our second hypothesis when there is a decreasing in the total functional range of functions from the seed to ceiling transition, right? So for the second part where we were interested in evaluating the conspecific negative density attendance by evaluating the changes in density from seed to ceiling, what we found is that across all the different years, the slopes of that relationship were very, very low, suggesting that there are important negative density dependent processes operating at the same time within a species. So uh, to summarize my results, we have one part that is evaluating the, the, uh, the importance of interspecific variation in traits. And what is that suggesting is that uh, there is a decreasing uh, in the, in a decrease in the total range of functions from the seed to ceiling transition. And then, and then in the second part, we have um, um, analysis that is evaluating the importance of intraspecific interaction. And what this is suggesting is that there are negative density dependent processes operating within species. So um, overall, what we see is something like this when we have uh, at the seed stage, a combination of different species that overall represent a very broad range of different functions. But then when these species start to germinate, what happens is that th that broad range of functions is highly restricted here. But then within this restricted um, uh, volume of functions, there are still negative density dependent processes operating within a species that are increasing the, function, the, the species diversity uh, within that constrained volume of function. So in conclusion, we have two opposite forces that are operating simultaneously at different levels. One is operating within a species and the other one is operating across species. And that is leading that high mortality in this seed to ceiling transition. Now, one thing that I want to highlight from this study here is that it is shedding light not of, on a set of mechanisms that are operating within a species, but because of the resolution of the data that we have uh, for functional traits in this study, we were not able to explore. And that is why I wanted to uh, do for my second project uh, to evaluate the importance of intraspecific trait variation as related with the patterns of a species abundance. So um, traditionally in ecology, the studies that use the trait information have often overemphasized the importance of uh, differences across different uh, species. And that is why in many times those um, studies have used only one single value for the different species as the, as the study that I just presented before, right? So we have that in this case, each different color is representing one species across this range um, of different, of, uh, in the, in the trid axis. However, we know that uh, the individuals are never identical and there is a lot of diversity at the population level. So once we start sampling and considering that information at the individual level, what we got is something like this, where each of the different species is actually represented by a range of different values. So is this information at intraspecific level important for understanding general patterns in ecology, such as the species abundance distribution? So that was uh, the question that I wanted to evaluate with this project here, when I wanted to know whether that magnitude of intraspecific variation was uh, related with the relative abundance of the species. So for this project, I have 
two different hypotheses. One is in an heterogeneous environment, we would have a common species that would be a generalist and with broad tolerances for all the different habitats in that particular environment. And I would, what would expect in this situation is that that common species would be more variable in the intraspecific traits. In the other extreme, the rare species would be more specialist and more focused on one particular, uh, on particular resources that are narrowly or no, restrictly distributed in the space. And in this case, what I would expect is to find this species or to have lower intraspecific variability in traits. Now, we could have also another situation in a less heterogeneous environment. And in this case, the common species would be um, represented by individuals that are overall performing well across the entire area. And in this case, I would expect these common species to be less viable in their traits. While in the other stream, the rare species would be more ill-suited to the available habitats. And in this case, I would expect these com rare species to be more variable in traits. And this variability in traits will indicate the struggle of these species in trying to adjust to those local conditions. In addition to that, I would expect common species overall to be less variable in performance and rare species to be more variable in performance overall. So I wanted to test these uh, two different hypotheses in natural communities in uh, tropical fielding. So um, I set up an observational design in Puerto Rico and another one in Sichuanbana in China in a tropical rainforest. So I wanted to evaluate whether the patterns that we observed in one site were consistent with the patterns in other uh, forest, also tropical forests. So for each of the different sites, we set up uh, 200 plots of ceilings of one meter by one meter, like this here. So in total, we have about two, uh, 400 plots where we were analyzing survival and growth and recruitment for one year. And after that one year, we collected all the individuals and we measured, again, several traits for each of those individuals. And what I wanted to do in this um, particular project was to evaluate whether the variance on those traits was changing across the different species and was related with the abundance. So I estimate the variance for each of those traits for each of the different species and correlate that with the species relative abundance. Now, given the important variation in sample size, I use a rarefaction in order to estimate more comparable estimates. So here, are some of the results. So uh, these are the results for China and these are results for Puerto Rico. The y-axis in this figure indicate the variance in different traits and the x-axis represents the logarithm of the abundance. So what we see is that overall there is a negative correlation indicating that common species tend to be less variable in traits uh, than rare species across the, uh, for all the different traits that we observe for both sides. Now, for in terms of growth, uh, we observe again the similar uh, negative correlation that is indicating that negative, that common species tend to be less variable in performance than rare species. Now, in addition to that uh, part by that uh, evaluate the magnitude, how the the magnitude of the intraspecific variation was changing across the species. I also wanted to know what was the relative position of these uh, species in the total functional space of the community. So whether the common species were occupying more central positions of the total functional space or and, and rare species were more peripheral in that um, functional space. So I did that for, uh, Puerto Rico and China, and what is showing this figure here is that for all the different species that are represented in the y-axis here, common species that are in this part of the plot tend to be more close to that mean position of the community, while rare species tend to deviate more for, for that central part. 
And now <laughs> this is uh, for the uh, results from Puerto Rico and China, but we also have, I'm sorry, um, in an additional project, we are testing a similar idea, but now including uh, plot data uh, from temperate and tropical so forest. So from this uh, study here, I'm using uh, this network of different plots that uh, I mentioned before, where we have in a systematic way all the data for different communities across the entire world. And what we have found across all these different sites is again that rare species tend to occupy peripheral positions in that functional space. So uh, to summarize my, my results of this um, study, we have first that uh, we evaluate the magnitude of that intraspecific variation and whether it was related with the species relative abundance and we found that common species tend to be less variable in traits than rare species. And in the second part, I evaluate the positions of these species in the total trait space. And what I found is that common species tend to occupy more core positions than um, rare species. So uh, what these results are suggesting is that common and rare species have different ecological requirements and are probably different also in the persistence in the community. So common species tend to be less variable in traits, are occupying more central positions. And probably that is indicating that these species are well fitting, be fitted to those local conditions and uh, could be more persistent in the community. While in the other side, we have species that are more variable in traits are and, uh, occupying the peripheral positions of the total trait space suggesting that probably these species are not very well fitted to the local conditions and this variability in traits will allow them to um, try to adjust to those local conditions, colonize, disappear, but recolonize again in other um, events. So um, now I would like to summarize uh, my main results. So for the first project I found that there are opposite mechanisms that are operating simultaneously at intra and interspecific levels and that are driving these changes in functional and species composition across the seed to seedling transition. Now in the second part, I found that the species vary in the magnitude of that intraspecific variation in traits and performance and also the relative position of the species in the total trait space changes across the species. And this variation is related with the parents of the species abundance. So um, now if we would like, if, if we go back to the main general framework that I presented at the beginning of the presentation today, where I was asking what was the role of the phenotype of these individuals as related with the parents of the species abundance. What I would say is that uh, by including the information of um, traits of different species will help us to better understand the mechanisms that are underlying this type of parents in ecology. But beyond that, I would say that having information at individual level, at uh, trade information at individual level will also give important insights on the type of general parents in ecology such as the species abundance distribution. So uh, with that, I would like to now go uh, and present some very briefly some of the current research uh, that I'm doing right now. So uh, for the previous study, I was mostly focused on understanding the role of, of traits as related with the species abundance, but I didn't explore in too detail this link here between traits and demography. And that is uh, the project that I'm working on right now. So the idea with this project was to evaluate the importance of uh, phenotypic differences at influencing the performance of the seedlings. So in the forest, we could have uh, uh, situations where there are individuals that are often surrounded by other individuals. And these other individuals could be different or similar in their traits and in their ecological strategy. So what I wanted to test was 
what how how was uh, what was the role of that uh, trade dissimilarity in the neighborhood at affecting the growth rates of the fielding? So we could have, for example, situations like this, where this focal where this focal individual has neighbors uh, that are very similar in their traits, and I'm representing that by similar colors. While we could have another situation with that focal individual is surrounded by very different. Uh, neighbors and what I would expect with that is that in these situations where all the uh, neighbors are very similar in traits probably the, the strength of the interactions would be higher and that will lead to lower relative growth rate of that focal ceiling while in this other case where all the uh, neighbors are very different in traits the, the, the strength of the interactions maybe are not so strong and that will lead to higher relative growth rates. So um, given the, the importance of negative density dependent mechanisms in the tropical communities, we could separate this effect by only considering conspecifics and then only considering heterospecifics. So in addition to the, to, to the effect of how similar or dissimilar you are from your neighbors, I would say that the phenotype itself will affect the performance of these feelings. So whether you have a very small and thick leaf will have a different effect on the, on the growth rate of the feelings than whether you have a bigger and thinner leaf, right? And that would depend on the environment. So for this study, I want to evaluate and predict the growth rates of the feelings based on those two ideas. The, the effect of the phenotype itself and the effect of the trade dissimilarity in neighbors. And besides that, uh, I also wanted to evaluate the importance of density uh, of conspecifics and heterospecifics. So this part here was, again, separating between conspecifics and heterospecifics. And uh, this model was tested for the um, uh, seedling communities in China. So what we found is that um, we found a negative effect of the density of conspecifics at predicting the ceiling growth rates uh, of this community, indicating that there is a negative density dependent, uh, dependent processes operating over these natural communities. Now, in addition to that, we also found that there is an effect of the phenotype itself on the growth of those seedlings. So seedlings that are investing more in leaf tissue tend to have higher relative growth rates than uh, seedlings that are investing less in leaf tissue. Now re related with this, with the effect of the trade dissimilarity, we found no significant effect. So what I think is explaining this result is that the traits that we evaluated uh, in, in this case, and the, in the, the traits that we consider for this particular study are traits that are related with the resource acquisition. And uh, previous studies in tropical communities have suggested that plants, particularly at those early ontogenetic stages, uh, stages are not competing strongly by resources. So these negative density dependent effects that we are observing are probably leading by um, pathogens and herbivores that uh, in this case we're not uh, considering in the traits of our study. So overall, what I, uh, the, the idea of this project of what I think is suggesting is that considering that performance information is also relevant to better understand the forces that are operating in these uh, natural communities. Now with that, I would like to finish my talk by going through some um, future directions. So, and I would like to start by uh, presenting what it would be the central aim of my lab, and that is to understand the ecological forces that structure uh, plant communities and maintain diversity. So, uh, through all these different projects that I presented in this talk today, I was mainly focused on one particular question that was 
related with the parents of the species around them. However, I'm broadly interested in understanding main uh, or on, in, in exploring main foundational questions in ecology, such as what maintains the diversity in tropical communities, what are the mechanisms that are assembling these communities. And um, what I have showed that tr through, through all those different projects is that by integrating information and functional and demographic traits that mediate this species environment relationship is relevant to have a better understanding and uh, a better answer on these uh, questions. So overall, my, my, the focus of my lab would be to understand this species environment relationship and how is that changing through space and time. So what I'm going to do now is to present some of the examples of questions um, that I would like to pursue in my future career. So in terms of understanding this species environment relationship, what I have advocated is that we need to uh, consider information of traits and performance information. And this is often measured at the level of individuals. And uh, this performance is um, evaluated as uh, in different components as survival and growth. But uh, these uh, different components of performance can change across ontogeny, and I'm going to uh, give an example in the next slide. So what I'm interested in knowing is how this link between traits and uh, performance is changing when we are considering different uh, components of this uh, performance across uh, ontogeny. And the idea with that is that uh, would allow us to have a more holistic understanding of the performance of the, of the individual across the entire life and that, uh, and how is that related with the population growth rate that I think is one of the most important questions uh, to solve. So, uh, for example, at the seedling communities in tropical forests, the dynamics are very fast, so mortality and recruitment happens very, very fast, but growth is overall very slow. Once these seedlings start to grow, what happens is that the dynamics become a little bit slower. So, there is a variation in these um, uh, different components of performance, and I'm interested to know how that is changing in relationship with traits. Now, um, another example uh, that of question that I would like to pursue in, in my future is uh, this link here between species and a phase and a species environment relationship. So we know that uh, the trees often are broadly distributed, the species of trees are broadly distributed across different environments. And the patterns that we observe at one local scale and the processes that we infer at one local scale are maybe not the same that are happening in other parts of the ranges of these species. So um, based on this idea, I wanted to evaluate how the uh, growth of different individuals of different species were changing across an environmental gradient in, uh, in the island of Puerto Rico. So this project started as a part of, uh, of my DDIG um, project. And what I wanted to do here was to evaluate how the, this performance is changing across this environmental gradient of elevation and uh, how is that changing with traits. So we have this um, altitudinal gradient that goes from 250 meters to 1,000 meters, and every 50 meters in elevation, uh, there are these, uh, I set up these uh, uh, stations where I was monitoring the growth of a group of individuals for uh, different species that were broadly distributed across that gradient. So uh, here I'm showing an example of how that design uh, was done. So here I'm showing only the, the uh, an example of one species, 
and we have that at different elevations there are different individuals that have been monitoring for growth and I have also collected uh, several traits for all these different individuals. So my idea here is to apply for a long-term research in environmental biology program from, N from NSF in order to continue this long-term monitoring um, in this project and have uh, an idea uh, and test some of the uh, ideas related with the context, the context dependent processes that are occurring across environmental grants. Now, um, an additional example that I would like to evaluate is related with the temporal dynamics. So we know that communities are not fixed in time. And for example, uh, species abundance is changing through time and these variations in, in, in species abundance and this temporal turnover have influenced a lot of theories in ecology such as island biogeography, neutral theory, storage effects. And um, so despite the importance of these temporal processes, there are not too many tests in ecology and I think that the main limitation is because we don't have long-term data in many of the communities in particular for tropical forests. However, there are these uh, networks such as the CTFS uh, network of flows that is the one that I have been using during this uh, previous study that I just um, showed, uh, LTR, USDA, LTDN that have been collecting um, demographic information and recruitment on uh, several communities that, that are occurring naturally in tropical forest and we have right now about three decades of, of, of data where we can start um, responding and answering some, some of these uh, questions related with temporal dynamics. So one of the questions that I will be interested in responding is how do species traits influence the species persistence? So whether there are some traits that have been constant and present across all the uh, different years and whether there are others that have been suffering more turnover. And uh, this type of, of projects will help us to better predict what are, what, what are going to be the changes in functional composition and species composition with the climate uh, change happening. So and with that, uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I would like to also thank to all the people that has been involved in the projects, my advisor Nathan Swenson, uh, my lab mates, my collaborators, my field assistants and my funding sources. Thank you very much and I would be happy to take your questions. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, so the, the, the project that I presented was at local scale and in very short term. So my idea with these uh, other projects that, I'm, uh, that I want to pursue in my future is trying to test that because I'm thinking that mo many of the species probably that were rare at that particular site are abundant in other parts, right? So the patterns could change when we consider larger scales. And um, previous studies have also shown that this species, that the species abundance is changing. So some species are disappearing completely and 
suddenly they appear again in the community, right? And that is something that I'm suggesting with that other project. There is like some transient dynamics in these communities. So uh, yeah, the idea would be to test those actual, like those temporal dynamics with actual temporal data that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, when the 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 um, the results that I just showed was were based on one particular uh, metric that was the functional richness, but we also analyzed other metrics or other functional metrics, and uh, that is the functional evenness. And what the those uh, that metric is suggesting, and the, there is that there are also evenness hap have happening in those communities, right? So there are different. Uh, mechanisms operating in different ways, and one of the one of the things that is suggesting this result is that within a species there is these negative effects of the species uh, of the individuals that are thinning a lot of individuals. So there is not only this contraction in the functional states, but within a species there are also important mechanisms that are operating and that are the responsibles of this high mortality. Mm -hmm. If the strength of, no, well, so we were, we didn't, uh, yeah, that is, that is also uh, another uh, idea that I'm considering. So you are thinking whether the strength of that negative density dependence is linked with the traits of the different species, right? right. So yeah, no, for that particular project, we didn't uh, actually test that. But there is a new a study from Panama that is suggesting that uh, uh, species with, um, that are investing more in seed size tend to have lower, that the strength of negative density dependent processes tend to be lower for those species. So the, the species that uh, have more tolerant uh, seeds tend to have a lower strength of negative density dependent processes. So that is a very nice study that is uh, suggesting that depending on the on the strategy, you could have very different uh, or variation in the strength of negative density dependence. And could that strength of negative density dependence within a species then be related to the dynamics between species as well? Are they similar traits or are they different traits that control that strength of dependence? Yeah. Well, the the there are there are processes that are occurring that are happening across different species. But what, yeah, but what we what are, what we are observing is that there are more constraint yeah. in that and not too much differentiation in the right. mm -hmm, in the ecological strategies. Okay. Yes.
for in that particular project. So yeah, that for that particular project, we estimate the value of like we only have one one value for a species that was the mean value for the species, right? We didn't have any intraspecific variation. Uh, That, that is the second one. Uh huh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you repeat again? The. Then the mean variance. Yeah, but in that case. Uh, it, it wouldn't, like if, if the variance changes, that, that wouldn't affect the, the parent, right? I'm, I'm evaluating how that variance within a species changes independence on, on, on the mean. Yeah, that is, uh, very good question, and I don't have. Yeah, yeah, in the variability of well whether um, more stochastic processes affecting like more but that would be related with uh, the, the, the transient dynamics right like how uh, the the species whether that are migrating and the species that are more rare and that are um, uh, with a small population size will be probably more viable because they come from other communities from around. That would be probably another mm -hmm. and not necessarily related with the heterogeneity of them. Thank you very much.